The Home Tech Podcast is supported by you. To find out more, go to hometech.fm slash support. This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, June 28th from Denver, Colorado. I'm Jason Griffin. And from sunny Sarasota, Florida, I'm Seth Johnson. Jason, what's going on? Yeah, how you doing? Fourth of July coming up. Yeah, it's coming up fast. I mean, we were looking at the calendar. What's today? It's the 20, 25th. Next week is July 4th weekend. Yeah, I can't believe the year's almost halfway over. I'm just shaking as my we're head. Sitting yeah. here recording. <laughs> it goes, goes by quick. Do you have any plans for the 4th? No, probably like fireworks, maybe. I I guess like we'll we'll it's get about some. As, as crazy as it gets these days, right? Yeah. Well, well, I think last year my neighbor, like my neighbors across the street, uh, had a bunch of friends over, and like we live in a cul-de-sac, so like there's really no one else around except a couple of homes, and they they were they were the guys that bought the like the big giant packs, right? The big giant right explosion pack things, and they were setting them off there. In, in the in the front yard, my, of course, my daughter slept through all of this, and and so we we were shooting little tiny little Roman candle things off in the background, going uh, in the backyard, going ooh, and then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose out front, and so <laughs> um, we had neighbors that were like on the next street over, come walk over to our house, and we're like, hey, did you guys do that show? That was great. It was better than going downtown. You know, it's like okay, how funny. Ho- hopefully, they'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, we we don't have a ton of plans either. There's a a local event at a, a really big park that's nearby that we'll probably go to uh, during the day. But yeah, we'll, we'll head back and we have similar sort of experience in our neighborhood where lots of neighbors light, lighting off fireworks. And unfortunately, we're ho- well, we're hoping this year that my daughter will be uh, a little bit better. But the last couple of years, it's really freaked her out. She's like very much not into that. Um, and so, yeah, it'll just be funny this year to see it. It usually ends up uh, what... what um, what Fourth of July basically translates to in our house now is uh, daughters sleeping in our bed night because she's too scared of the fireworks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I say that my daughter may sleep through it, but uh, you know, kids change. They like they do different things. Like she this year, she may be yeah, freaked yeah you out, never so. know. Yeah, so yeah. hopefully, hopefully, she does what she normally does and sleeps through the entire night and just like right. <laughs> tunes doesn't want to wake up and tunes out the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, yeah, that's coming right up. So I hope you have a great fourth. And yeah, our next show that we release will be one day after. So big holiday coming up and we'll look forward to that. But just uh, just you and me here on this episode, Seth. And what do you say we jump into some home tech headlines? Let's do it. TiVo is getting ready to introduce the next generation of its DVR. If a new FCC filing is any indication, the new device, which is being called the TiVo Edge, it's like TiVo Extreme, uh, is once again <laughs> being made by set-top box manufacturer Eris. Eris FCC filing is heavily redacted, but the naming of the documents included in the filing makes it clear that this is, in fact, a Series 7 device. This would represent a, the first major refresh of the TiVo lineup since the introduction of the Series 6 Bolt devices in way back in 2015. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, Zat's not funny. Dave Zat's doing some good reporting on that. We'll link to a story of his in the show notes and some good commentary in there. But but it's interesting. It looks like this model in question is for cable, quote, according to the FCC filing. So uh, this will be like a cable card type of device. You know, in the past, TiVo has made separate models for uh, cable cards and, and cord cutters. And uh, it's just interesting to see what's going on with TiVo. They've They've been moving away from the hardware manufacturing. I know they they partnered with Aris to manufacture the Bolt. Um, so, you know, not a big surprise to see them working together. But, um, yeah, they've just been an interesting story to watch. And like you were saying before we started recording tonight, they seem to have some staying power. Um, questions sort of swirling about their the health of their business right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I love my TiVo. It's, but it's been a long time since I used it. I sold them all off. Uh, to other people who wanted them, and and I never got I never got the the bent one. I think that's the the Series Six Bolt models, where the bent white looking things. Yep. Never never bought that one. So that was about the time that I started pulling back and thinking about cutting the cord. And and then when I finally did it, of course, TiVo's not needed. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll keep an eye on that. Moving on here, Dish has announced the launch of Dish Fiber, uh, a combined Wi-Fi and live streaming TV bundle for those living in multifamily communities, such as apartment blocks and student housing. 
The service lets landlords offer two services, Wi-Fi and live stream TV, direct to their tenants, while the property owner manages the overall contract with DISH. Each resident has access to their own personal network. So pretty interesting. I know in, in my days as an integrator, we were always sort of grappling with uh, the any, anytime we try to do like sort of condo or or these types of units, if there was any sort of rental involved, it was always kind of a, a, a question mark of how these contracts would work. And I know we had more, it seemed like more and more MDU uh, developers were looking at ways to kind of integrate TV or network uh, into their offerings. So I'm not sure uh, how this will play out in the professional market, but interesting nonetheless. I want to say DirecTV has been doing this for years. Like that was DirecTV or going with the cable company was your only option. I know they had something similar to this. And I know there's some, a couple of other like cable type companies. I can't remember, maybe Charter or something like that, uh, have a similar service where they install, like we have some bigger developments here that some random cable company came into and said, we're going to do the service on this. And they hooked up, you basically have a satellite dish, uh, a big satellite dish as you drive into the complex. And then they, they actually pipe the cable signal through traditional copper lines out to all the houses. So um, I, I feel like this has been, been done before, but not by dish, I guess, is what, what the story yeah. is about. Yep. Coming up, coming up, Prime Day is rumored to take place on July 15th. Uh, but you don't have to wait until then to score a 4K TV at a great price. Amazon has already taken the axe to some of the prices, reducing a handful of top-rated big brand televisions as much as 46%. Uh, a couple of examples here. 50-inch Toshiba Fire TV Edition, $300, down 80 bucks. Uh, 55-inch Samsung 7 Series 4K TV is $498, down about $100. And a TCL, this is our favorite, show favorite, 65-inch TCL 6 Series 4K TV, $700, down, uh, I question this, down $700. I, always, I feel like this one's been around this price before, um, but it's Yeah, def- you know, we were, yeah, I'm sorry. We, we were talking about this before the show, and I just realized now, I, I, I do think this is actually a pretty good deal. I, I was thinking back, we were talking about, I, I own the 6 Series, but what I didn't catch is this is the 65 inch and I own a 55 and I, I want to say that when when we bought our 55 that we actually paid about that so I, I I think there's actually getting a pretty good deal here in the sense that yeah like that's the price we paid for a 55 and you can now go pick up a 65 uh, for that price so I gotta say we've been really happy with our our six series it's a, a great TV and it as we talked about numerous times leading up to my purchase it was consistently ranked as one of the best TVs in 2018 for under $1,000. And uh, so far, we've been really happy with it. Good deal. Good deal. A couple, couple other things to keep in mind. The Prime Day, like I said, keep, kicks off on Monday, July 15th, ends on July 16th. That's that's the rumor. Uh, this will be the longest day at 48 hours in length. I don't know how that... Maybe it goes all the way to the end of July 16th, so that makes it 48 hours. And uh, you need to be a Prime member, of course, to access the deals. And... Uh, the big deals this year, probably on 4K TVs and smartwatches. Uh, but also keep an eye out. This is a good hint I saw. Walmart and Best Buy will also likely have discounts on the same day. So yeah. just keep, keep an eye out for that competition. Good old capitalism. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, take, take advantage of it. I, I saw a story as I was preparing for this week's episode of Target was also getting ready to do like a 48-hour deal where you could get free shipping on anything on their site. So, uh, like you said, capitalism at, at, at work here and everyone's kind of being forced to react to Amazon driving this prime day, all, all of these deals. And, and that's to the benefit of, of consumers. So if you're looking for some new tech, now's a good time. July 15th coming right up. One quick, th- one quick deal I saw, uh, the Google home, the old Google home that we've been, that we talked about, I know they come out with the Google nest, hub which is the the screen thing that they have basically but I, i've seen that one as low as like 70 dollars recently so um the deals are to be had on, out on that one thing and that's like i, I think it started shipping at 150 or 200 dollars somewhere on there yeah so as they try, yeah, try and clear deal. out that in, in inventory uh to, for the new ones to come in uh yeah pick up one of those because it's a pretty good little kitchen device amazon garage sale yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of Amazon, Amazon Music will be integrated for the first time by a pay TV provider through a new deal with Comcast's Xfinity X1 and Xfinity Flex services. The streaming music service will roll out on Comcast over the coming weeks on X1, which serves two-thirds of Comcast's 21 million households. 
as well as on its recently launched internet-only Flex platform. The move follows last year's integration of Prime Video into X1, which also features Netflix, YouTube, and other streaming apps alongside traditional pay TV content. Uh, that sounds pretty cool. If you're a Comcast, you get a little bit of uh, Amazon Music, which I'm so confused by this Amazon Music thing. Like, it's just so nebulous to me, right? Like, um, Yeah, they, well, they've got like multiple uh, tiers, offerings now. Yeah. Tiers, yeah. I think they've just, I don't know, maybe done a bad job of sort of packaging it up because uh, you don't, you know, it, that's really all it is. It's like it, it's tiers and you get a certain level with Prime, but then they've got Amazon Music, which is like their their sort of more robust offering. But yeah, it's it's an interesting trend that we've seen more in recent years with um, streaming options being uh, bundled along uh, traditional offerings. And, and I think you're just seeing companies like Comcast try to find ways to reduce churn any way that they can yeah. and add little value adds here. And so, you know, it's de- definitely not a bad thing. And, for and people, their customers definitely do appreciate that. Like I, I have a friend that... Uh, that kind of switches back and forth between Verizon and Comcast or Frontier, I guess now and Comcast all the time because like he likes some features. Like he was on Frontier with the and then Comcast came out with some kind of like the X1 voice remote thing. And he's a he's a builder and a lot of his clients were getting that uh remote and he was seeing like how much you could do with the voice search remote. And I, I think his partner, uh like his business partner got got the same thing and was showing him that you could do it. And he switched over to that. And he's like, well, can we, I, I have a control four system in his house. He's like, Hey, can we get, can we get this control four remote to talk to Comcast? Any kind of way? And he's like, Nope, can't do that. Um, but he, he's the, people like these little value add features that you can add on to it. And believe it or not, like things like this just go a long way for a lot of customers. So, um, it, yeah, it's good to see absolutely. them being a little more progressive and, and customer oriented. You know, you don't hear about right. cable companies right. doing that often. <laughs> no, you certainly don't. Amazon announced a new upgraded Fire TV called the Fire TV. Get this, Jason, another EU edition. Ooh. Uh, it has Dolby Vision. Yeah, Dolby Vision. This is basically an upgraded Fire TV, uh, that, and the display model is made by Toshiba. A 55 inch uh, model is available. Uh, starting today for $450 with the 43 and 50 inch versions arriving on the 30th, costing $330 and $380 respectively. One of the most compelling features of the Fire TV Edition is its integration with all Echo devices. Uh, You can get Alexa to turn on your TV and pick up where you left off uh, on your last binge. Yeah, no, it's interesting to see. I mean, um, they've had their their Fire TV edition out before. This uh, this appears to be sort of just a next gen. There's not a, a ton of differences being reported, other than of course the addition of uh, of Dolby Vision. And you know, they've they've looks like partnered with some content providers to make search uh, really easy. So there was a demo where they said, you know, watch Our Planet, for example, and it pulled up a list of results and launched Netflix and all, all of the stuff that you're sort of starting to come to expect. Uh, from these things also was interesting. They talked about um, uh, camera integration. So they showed this in a demo. Sounds like they had sort of a, a private showing, not a private, but a kind of an exclusive showing to the press of this. And during the demo, they brought up, you know, cameras right on the TV using voice commands. Um, so that's kind of nice as well. So just another good option out there. Um, if you're looking for a, a, a TV with kind of that input zero functionality, right? No additional external boxes required. All of the All of the smarts just sort of built right in. Yep. Sounds pretty cool. All right. Well, moving on here, Snap AV's Arachnus Networks has released two new wireless access point models designed to deliver high speed for installs with multiple wireless clients. The Arachnus 510 and 810 series indoor access points are powered by two, and I never remember how, if this is Mumimo or if you actually spell those letters out. Uh, multi-user, multi-input, multi-output is what that stands for uh, technology. So kind of the you know the latest hotness, I guess, there on on uh, on the uh, access points. Uh, as with all Arachnus products, these WAPs are compatible with Oversee, uh, SnapAV's remote management system, so dealers can check and resolve connectivity issues and can even create user profiles that customers can use to schedule and restrict Wi-Fi access. So as you know, I was interested to see the Oversee integration and. Of course, not surprised. Uh, all Arachnus Network stuff is has that baked in. I think it's it's to me one of the more compelling uh, features of of these devices. Yep, uh, it's getting interesting in that space. I got to say, it doesn't really matter that it has Oversee Oversee or Mumamamaimo 
Uh, like <laughs> no one, Mubimo? yeah, no one's gonna Mubimo? care about that. Just the client's gonna say, "Is my internet gonna be fast?" And you're gonna say, "Yes." Is gonna be right. stable. Yes, it's all anybody cares about. So yeah, that's that's the main selling selling points for these types of products. Um, thought it was pretty cool. They had two PoE ports, and uh, of course, it's dealer friendly installation product. So um, pretty pretty cool system, and it's it's I I do think it's nice that it has the overseas stuff built directly into the products because you it's that's kind of a tough thing to monitor these days. Um, yeah, well, like you said, you know, Wi-Fi is pretty pretty well standardized at this point and so to make a differentiated product you kind of have to have those those sort of value adds and i I just as every listeners to the show know i'm a big believer in the the importance of that remote management and remote service and so seeing that built in there i think will be really compelling uh for for many dealers and and clients as well just to provide a better user experience and better service experience is really important well speaking of wi-fi and things that you don't ever want to mention to people and acronyms for things. Uh, Jason, let's talk about Li-Fi. Oh, <laughs> got to cue up a <laughs> sound effect for that one. The, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> Light-Fi, I guess. I don't know. Signify, the company formerly known as Philips Lighting that produces the Hue branded smart lights, has announced a new range of internet transmitting Li-Fi lights called True Li-Fi. Uh, they're capable of transmitting data to devices like laptops at speeds of up to 150 megabits per second using light waves rather than the radio signals used by 4G or Wi-Fi. The product range will consist of both new lights as well as transceivers that can be retrofitted into existing lighting. Uh, the technology was initially targeted at professional markets like office buildings and hospitals rather than homes, uh, where it has the potential to reach a much wider audience. Li-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> it, this one's been a really intriguing one because like, it's, it's been around for a while. I mean, we've talked about Li-Fi numerous times on, on the show, but it, it does seem like it's, it's failed to really take off. And, and from my perspective, I'm not terribly shocked by that. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's something I'm missing, but I just can't... I, I just can't wrap my head around what the real use cases are for this, and there's there are some pretty clear uh, limitations. I mean, so one of the benefits that they talk about is that uh, for security, like it, it it can be more secure because you know any technologies that are built around, I, I suppose, um, radio frequency wouldn't be applicable here. Um, well, they go the radio goes through walls the light isn't going to go through the wall. So in theory, I guess security wise, if you had a, a Li-Fi room, it would be more secure than broadcasting, you know, with Wi-Fi, you're broadcasting that out. Yeah. Right. Point to point. Yeah. And they, t- they, but they talk about how that's also a downfall, right? Cause the signals can easily be blocked. Exactly. Um, so even like if you're in a shadow, uh, that Li-Fi signal is not going to reach you. So definitely some limitations, but I, I don't know, maybe in, in, high security, like you said, or point-to-point type of applications or high radio frequency environments where there's a lot of interference. You know, I I suppose I can certainly see some use cases there, but they seem really specialized. So my, you know, my prediction is that this technology is something that's going to continue to be developed, but really for very particular use cases, it's not something that's ever really going to replace uh, Wi-Fi as we know it today. Yeah, because Wi-Fi is so ubiquitous. Like you buy a laptop, it's got Wi-Fi. It does. It's not going to come with Wi-Fi. In fact, you got to get these little USB plugs to plug into your computer to actually receive the Wi-Fi f- signal from these these lights that they developed. Yep. So it, it's like extra equipment that you need and not as proven. And I guess we just we just talked about stability and, and internet being fast. Like those are two very important things that Wi-Fi has proven over time that it can do. Uh, this product does not have that backing behind it but um so like you said it's got a long way to go um but it it does like they mentioned in this article they mentioned hospitals which i you know don't really think about too much but i know um our friend uh nate up there in uh, in boston he does work in hospitals i wonder what he would say about that because i know that you have to have all sorts of special kind of certifications just by listening to his shows. You have to have all sorts of special certifications to have equipment inside of a hospital like right? for RF frequency emitting and all that stuff. Like it's, it's well beyond what stuff goes into your house uh, gets. So um, that could be a, a pretty good, that could actually be an excellent place to have this uh, if it works as, as they advertise. Right. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have any adverse health effects. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> 
<laughs> then there's that, of course. Yeah, there's yeah, that. Yeah, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on it. It's an it is an int- intriguing technology, I would say. But yeah, I'm just kind of struggling to figure out what the use cases are. I, I think they're pretty specialized. Right. Moving on here, Google made it clear that it would apply the Nest name to all smart home products moving forward. This, of course, after the uh, unification of those brands, it was big news. But it wasn't totally clear if they would rename their classic products. Uh, we now have a better idea. As of, uh, as of this show, uh, according here to Engadget, a visit to the Connected Home Accessories section of Google Store, uh, the Special Offers page, shows the Google Home's replaceable base as, quote, the Nest Home Base. The product page still refers to the speaker by its original name, but you will also find this change in the terms and conditions uh, of the Google Home. So, Interesting story. Not a ton of implications here, but but does provide a glimpse into the, I guess, extent to which Google will be re, rebranding or renaming devices. So it does appear, according to this article, that the Google Home, Google Home Max, Google Home Mini, all of those may be on their way to a name replacement here in the near future. Yeah. And, and as further evidence by the fire sale <laughs> that I mentioned earlier... Uh, yeah. You know, you, you yep. got to get those things off the show. I, oddly enough, I've been in like Target recently and I went to look to see if I could pick up a, a Google Home Hub, I guess, for, you know, a price as low as $79. And it's still up at that, I think, $130, $140 range right now. So um, it hasn't hit retail yet, but uh, there are certain sites online that you can go to get get it for a lot lower. So, uh, yeah, I, but I, I, I think I think I'm going to hold out for the, the Nest the Nest Home Hub thing because that's. That that looks killer. It looks like it, it does a really good job. Yeah, I agree. Well, Jason, uh, fun story that we, we, we've got to touch on. So uh, there's, a, there's a story over The Verge called uh, GE Accidentally Makes the Case for Not Owning GE Smartphones. <laughs> <laughs> Love the title. And they, they, they have uh, anyone that's ever dabbled in a smart home knows that part of the experience involves an eventual reset. Having trouble with your... C by GE bulbs. No worries. Just follow these simple instructions. And uh, yeah, let me go ahead and read them. Uh, you go ahead and turn it off for eight seconds. Turn on for two seconds. Turn on for eight seconds. Oh, sorry. I already messed it up. <laughs> Start over. Yeah. Turn on for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds. Turn on for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds. Turn on for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds. Turn on. You see where this is going. Like it just <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It goes on for yeah, ten or ten or eleven steps of this. And uh I love this and too. And the bulb did did the bulb flash three times? This is from the verge. No, maybe you missed mistimed one of the eleven steps. GE recommends counting. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, (laughs) dot, dot, dot. This is real. This is a real story. Yeah. And it's a a real video, too, which is is linked at the top of the of the gate. And and, uh, Jason, I got to say, like this came out a couple weeks back and I thought it was funny uh, at the time. Um, I actually made something, a little parody video that we put up on our our home tech uh, YouTube channel. But um this is actually a really good video. Like if you, if, if this is the dumb steps that the company has come up with, with how to reset their bulbs, like the video is a, a really good way of, ex- like they do it in real time. They're not like speeding it up and saying, you got to do this eight on two off thing. You, they, they do it in real time. They, they show you a little counter. They got, have a person there flipping a switch on the light and the, and the guy telling you what, what to do at each, at each point. I, think it's a really good instructional video uh, unfortunately the process that they documented uh not all that great it's not all that great at all it, it's unbelievable to me i mean and and then it, by the way the verge story goes on to cite the fact that you might have an older version of the c by ge bulb in which case you need to do this process and it's the same sort of eight second two second cycle but it goes on for one to, oh wait, no. There's some variation in here. So this no, is variations. This yeah. is even worse. Turn <laughs> on for eight seconds, off for two, on for two, off for two, on for two, off for two. One more time through that, and then back to eight seconds and two seconds and eight seconds and two. So it's a total of thirteen steps. Uh, the other one is a total of eleven steps. And you know, all, all jokes aside, it, it is just like crazy to me that they would do this. Like, why would you? I understand that you have to design this reset sequence so that it never happens accidentally. Um, right. But like, 
five or six full power cycles, it, it just seems crazy excessive Ab- absurd yeah, um, yeah. I, well if you if, if you think that is crazy uh go on over to our home tech uh home tech youtube channel and uh, i have recompiled this uh to be over an hour and a half long of uh <laughs> ge reset something to fall asleep to like the yule, yeah, if the you, yule log version exactly exactly <laughs> if you have family and friends over put this on and i'm sure it's it will be the life of the soothing. party that's yeah. right <laughs> It is. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I agree with you. Like they did a good job on the how to video and that's nice and that helps. But, um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I think this is mostly just like how many people are actually going to be affected by this is, is, is pretty slim. So I, I don't make a, a ton of this story other than like, what were they thinking? Like, why wouldn't they just make it two, maybe three or maybe even two cycles through this is so unlikely to accidentally happen Um, so I don't know, maybe there was some other reason that I'm not understanding, but yeah, this just seems, this just seems crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you're a control four dealer, uh, you're familiar with the, like they have Zigbee reset sequences and those are like taps that you can do on the, on the top and bottom buttons of the, of the Zigbee keypads. I think other companies have, I mean, a lot of companies have these, but they're, they're more reasonable. Like I think one of them is like nine taps on top, four taps on the bottom, nine taps on the top, like Okay, there, reset at that point. Like if you turned your light off for, turned your light on for nine seconds, turned it off for four seconds and turned it back on for nine seconds, like that would be a great reset procedure for these bulbs, but not on and off, on and off, on and off repeatedly for, I don't know, how, how long is this? I mean, an hour and a half is, is what mine is, but I, this, this. You know what it makes me think of? Do you remember the, uh, do you remember the Contra code on Nint- Nintendo? <laughs> Yeah, it's like up, up, up down, up. down. Yeah, see if you can get it. I've got it in front of me. Do you remember it? Okay. Uh, so I wasn't a Nintendo guy. I was a Sega guy. So I think it was up, up, down, down, left, left, BBA start or something like that. <laughs> Select start. I don't know. You're pretty close. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA start. BA start. How many people yeah. are going to remember that? Don's in the chat room saying he was going to say that too. <laughs> 30 lives. 30 lives that would give you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some people that was a uh I, I, I had a Sega growing up, the Sega Genesis and uh, uh, you completely were a different Sega set guy. of games. <laughs> yeah, we, we we my my friends on the street had the Nintendo, I had the Sega, and we it was it was basically who could talk, you know, the most uh mess about each each other's <laughs> That's right. Oh, you know, we got the better. I graphics, always looked down know. my nose at you Sega guys. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. I got the Genesis now. What, you have all, I have Altered Beast. I mean, what are you going to do? That's Altered Beast. You cannot beat that with a Nintendo. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, good times. Well, that's funny. It is a, a funny video. Definitely go, uh, yeah, go check out Seth's parody if you're looking for some soothing uh, ambient, ambient video to play at your next uh, dinner party. It is actually pretty soothing. Like, the guy has a pretty good voice, and it's looped enough times where it's like, Oh yeah, that's that's pretty nice. That's nice. <laughs> Got a nice music playing in the background. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, all of the links and topics we've discussed on this episode can be found in our show notes at hometech.fm slash two six four. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter where we'll send you show reminders and other occasional updates about all of the great things going on here in the world of home tech. Once again, that link is hometech.fm slash two six four. And don't forget, you can join us in the chat room live Wednesday, starting sometime between 7 and 7.30 p.m. Eastern time zone. Uh, Find out more, go to hometech.fm slash live. All right, well, moving on from there, let's jump into our pick of the week, Seth. And speaking of Contra, Sega, Nintendo, we've got a throwback here for the pick of the week that I am a big fan fan of. I think you're going to go pick one of these up. I'm thinking about one as well. A throwback? It's a throw rug. <laughs> <laughs> Cue the... Uh, you, yeah. There you go. You nailed that one. A uh, square indoor rug from jcpenny.com. And this is a beauty. It's got, uh, I don't even know, all kinds of different, um, I guess, terminology here for the computer geeks. You've got, you know, RAM, ISP server, .doc, network, PC... Uh, dot com and a very sort of retro uh you know i I would say kind of like mid to late 90s uh color palette on this thing definitely harkens back to the early days of the internet and uh i'm a fan here what i don't know what i can't get a sense of from this 
picture is the size. Like how big is this rug? It's got to be a pretty good size. It's about seventy dollars. It is a f- fifty-one inches by fifty-one inches. So okay, yeah, it's a decent size, decent size rug. I, I am. It's a one half inch pile as well. So nylon made, quite clean. <laughs> it's imported, of course. Um, but man, this is a. Uh, this is something, and I, I got to say, like, uh, it, it, it is the most 90s rug I've ever seen, uh, or computer rug I've ever seen. If I, I had this at, like, one of those LAN parties, man, you would be a god, right? Like, this would be... <laughs> That's right. This is what you would set your, your folding table up over the top of this, and yeah. Oh, yeah, you're all set. Yeah. Look at this. It, it's even got, like, a power icon on there, uh, and an HTTP www dot with no address after it, just dot. They just left that... You know, it's important. Uh, it's a beauty. Yeah, CGI down there in the corner, like you know, because you used to see those websites with a CGI URL on them. Uh, and my favorite one is like the digital logo, almost like almost done. It was that company that digital uh, computers? Uh, they almost have their logo over there on the, on the side, but it's not quite. But man, it, it's a very. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to get one of these. It's it's on sale, Jason. It's like seventy two seventy four right now with this code. I wonder if you get free shipping, because uh, I can get it by July eighth too. Yeah, I mean this this there you this go. is something, and uh, I, it's kind of live here in the garage. I could use a rug or something, right? And this you could use you could use a little deadening. I could use this. Yes, this, this is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't know uh, J C Penny. Like for some reason, I, I guess I thought they had gone. Uh, didn't they go? Maybe they went through like a bank restructuring. I think or you're something. thinking maybe of Sears. Thinking of. Sears is the one that, that Sears. Went, went yeah. Yeah. Uh, but J.C. Penny in, in and of itself is kind of a throwback. I feel like at this point, I, I don't know. They're still hanging around, I guess. But brick and mortar. Yeah, this rug is a gem. Definitely go check it out if you're looking for some retro vibe in your in your man cave or your office or uh, or something to put in your family room to really you know piss off your significant other. <laughs> look no further. Right, right. Yeah, I'll tell you how the divorce goes <laughs> in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's not going to fly, so I can tell you that much. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not going to fly. Even in the garage, uh, half underneath a car, it's not going to fly. So <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, well, if you have any feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, or ideas for a show, topic, or guest, definitely give us a shout. We'd love to hear from you. Our email address is ho- uh, feedback at hometech.fm. Once again, that's feedback at hometech.fm, or if you would prefer, visit our website at hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. We want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support the show through our Patreon page. Uh, if you don't know about our Patreon page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support Home Tech for as little as $1 a month. Any pledge over $5 a month gets you a shout out on the show, but every pledge gets you an automated invite to our private Slack chat, The Hub, where you and other supporters of the show gather every day for uh, conversations about all aspects of home technology. Um, once again, that link is hometech.fm slash support. Absolutely. And if you want to support the show but can't do so financially, we'd love if you would take a few minutes to leave us a review on iTunes or in your podcast app of choice. If you're uh, if you're a fan or supporter of what we do here and you want to uh, help others find the show, that is like definitely the best way to do so. So take a few minutes. We would really appreciate it. And go again, leave us a review on iTunes or in your podcast app of choice. So, uh, so Don and I are trading, trading codes there in the chat room. <laughs> I see that. And I, 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 I put the, uh, Hayes modem commands in there. Uh, and I, it just brought me back to like thinking about what those were. ATH, Zero plus plus plus, you know, no carrier. Yeah, there's all sorts of fun stuff. I remember. Oh man, I remember like being on these chat rooms on these on these boards and like getting people to type those codes in. Like you would you would fool them into typing those codes in somehow, and they would you would just see them hang up, and you're like, yes, I got them. Like that was <laughs> sucker. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was the sucker on the other end of that. <laughs> like, the what way. the heck? I just hung up on myself. <laughs> Yeah, that was totally me. <laughs> yeah, this is it's a it's a throwback. I in my ear in my head right now I'm hearing the sound of my dial up modem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beep. That's right. You have to edit that in. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I will have to. <laughs> I guess uh, Don posted a Commodore. This, this is before my time. Don posted load eight star one, eight one no load star eight one. 
and that's a Commodore thing. I'm not, I'm not familiar with Commodore very much. So Even Stump Seth. Yeah, I had to go look it up. Let's uh, load the first program <laughs> on the disk from the file specified memory location. One of the more popular load commands of the platform. So Commodore, Commodore computers. Yeah, we're going way back. We're going way back. There you go. Throwback, uh, throwback episode here. Throwback, throwback, throwback episode and throwback road. So. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening, Jason. I will have a great weekend and I will talk to you next week. Yeah, likewise. You as well, Seth. And I hope you have a great uh, 4th of July and we'll I'll look forward to connecting with you again next week. All right. Sounds good. See ya. All right. Take care.